Uh, today we start uh, a new topic it's, uh, given on the slide called instrumental variables regression. Uh, we will have two lectures, so I have pretty much of material and decided to split it into two lectures. So today we will discuss mostly the idea of this type of regression and uh, this is something new. It uh, differs from the familiar OLS and so we will discuss some let's say conceptual issues of this. So what is this? Why do we want to use it? And how it helps uh, in some circumstances. And the next lecture next week is going to be more applied. Uh, we will discuss the estimation issues, uh, some tests, uh, statistical tests related to the instrumental variables. And of course, we will have some um, empirical exercise for this. So let's start with uh, the following issue, something which is called internal validity. Now we've been talking about this uh, many times, but we didn't, uh, let's say, explicitly uh, named it. So we call a statistical analysis uh, internally valid, or a statistical analysis has internal validity if statistical inferences, so hypothesis tests, and uh, confidence intervals about causal effects are valid for the population being studied. Uh, this was the cornerstone of statistics, that was the cornerstone of econometrics uh, first part. We spoke that once we have a random sample, we want to be sure that everything that we study based on this random sample is then applicable to the population. Uh, this is about the internal validity. And uh, we know that if all the rules are satisfied, then uh, internal validity must hold. But we also know that, well, what does this mean? All the rules are satisfied. In this case, we want the causal effect estimate to be unbiased and consistent. Unbiased means that the expected value of the estimator equals to the population parameter. And consistent means that as we increase the sample size, the probability that our estimator uh, deviates from the population uh, parameter shrinks to zero. Um, and also we want uh, the following thing. So this is related to the estimator and this is related to the standard errors. We want uh, hypothesis tests to have the desired significance level. What does this mean? It means that if we set uh, a desired significance level like 5% or 1%, then the actual rejection rate is going to coincide with the significance level. Uh, if we fail to estimate standard errors uh, correctly, uh, you saw sometimes uh, that uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis tests may lead to the uh, wrong conclusions. So that's these are two issues that we always need to be careful about. So the last issue is more or less solved with the help of heteroscedastic standard errors, with the help of uh, what we have studied in panel data, heteroscedasticity uh, adjusted, well, heteroscedasticity and autocovariance robust uh, standard error. Uh, but here, regarding unbiasedness and consistency, Sometimes we have problems. You know that for different reasons, these requirements might not be met, and then it these are these cases are the threats to internal validity, and uh, we cannot believe or we cannot trust the results of our estimation procedure, and our estimation procedure is just useless.
Uh, and yes, these threads appear when one or more of the least squares assumption fail. We spoke about omitted variable bias as one uh, example of such case. But what you don't know yet that there are much more threads to internal validity together with the omitted variable bias. That's not all. And that's not enough just to control for all relevant variables. So yes, we know omitted variable bias as one example of, of such threads. And what is that when the omitted variable is correlated with the included variable, but is unobserved? And we cannot include this in the regression. Because if you if you observe this, that's totally fine. You can just include this as a control variable, and that's it. Uh, more important issue when it is not observed. And uh, partially we were able to solve this problem with the panel data. But still we are not sure whether it is enough or not. Next problem. Even if you are able to come up with some ideas of these relevant variables, sometimes it is not possible to measure them or measure them correctly. And this is called measurement error or error in, bi in variables bias, when x is measured imprecisely. So what does this mean? It means that sometimes you just you are not able to measure something. Assume that you ask people about their income. People may be not precise regarding their income. It differs from, let's say, collection of the data from some tax records or some other documents. When you make a survey, people can be not precise. It doesn't mean that they lie, they just probably don't know the exact answer. Or if you want to measure something like um, like uh, ability of a person. So how would you measure the mental ability of a person? Well, with the help of some kind of test, IQ test. But do you believe that this IQ test is a good measurement of a person's ability? Probably not. And we have a lot of issues, if you think about, we have a lot of issues when the variable that we want to measure can be measured imprecisely. And in this case, we have another type of bias. It is not immediate variable bias. It is called errors and variables bias. And the problem appears only when x is measured with uh, is measured imprecisely. If y is measured with errors, it's not a big deal. Well, I decided not to include this discussion into the lecture itself. If you are interested, you can read the book. But uh, we always need to be careful about this. And the third problem that also appears in many cases in economics is called simultaneous causality bias, causality bias. When you have two-way causality, when X causes Y and Y causes X. So we will discuss this issue uh, in the next slides. So, what is simultaneous causality? So far we assumed that causality runs in one way, from x to y. So if we change x, then y changes. But what if causality runs in the opposite direction, from y to x? Is this possible? Uh, if this happens, 
then OLS estimator is also biased. It's not about omitted variable bias, it's not about error in variables bias, it's another type of bias, which is not uh, able to, we are not able to overcome this problem, even if we include all the relevant variables. We still would have this problem, and also the problem of consistency, so increasing the sample size wouldn't help. Uh, let's think about an example of such simultaneous bias based on the familiar example. So if you take the study of test scores, we assume that changes in student-teacher ratio cause changes in test scores, right? So student-teacher ratio is X, is the independent variable, and test scores is the dependent variable. So we finish the first part of econometric scores with the extended version of multiple regression model. We included a lot of relevant variables and we somehow uh, believed that we overcame, at least particularly, uh, the problem of omitted variable bias. But now let's think about the following possible case. What if a government subsidizes the following problem. So they hire teachers in schools with poor test scores. Like if they believe that class size might affect the test scores, they can introduce a program. They look at the districts with low test scores and they hire more teachers to help those districts to overcome the problem of low scores. What happens in this case? We have two-way causality. So one usual way is that low student-teacher ratio leads to high test scores. Well, if there are few students per one teacher, we believe that this leads to better outcomes of students. But now, if there are districts with low test scores, if such government program is in place, what we will see? We will see that low test scores would cause low student-teacher ratio because those districts will obtain more people, more students, um, more teachers, sorry. And now the question is, when we have an observational data, when we collect the data on the uh, school districts, how to disentangle these two effects? We probably are not able to do that. And we are in trouble, even if we include many relevant variables, Still, the problem exists. We don't know how to, let's say, uh, split this causal effect from this causal effect. And if you think about this, there are many practical issues when you have this two-way causality in economics. Is that clear? What kind of problem do we have? Yes, it's simple. I mean, nothing, nothing is very difficult, but we are moving to the very practical things. Uh, let's discuss this issue uh, formally. What happens and why? What what assumption? What OLS assumption fails? Uh, consider two equations. So one is the usual OLS um, regression or model with one regressor, but now we introduce the reverse causality. So we introduce this reverse uh, causality equation when y affects x. Yes, the second equation represents the reverse causal effect. 
of y on x. Now, this simultaneous causality leads to the correlation between x and the error term. We know that omitted variable bias leads to the same problem. There is a correlation between x and, and, and uh, error term, and uh, if this correlation uh, occurs, uh, first assumption fails, and if the first assumption fails, uh, we are not able to estimate uh, the unbiased uh, causal effect, and also the causal the estimate is going to be inconsistent as well. So how to prove formally that this correlation occurs? We just want to compute what's going to be the covariance between x and u, between uh, the dependent variable and uh, the error term. So we plug instead of x the second equation here and then covariance uh, between the sum of variables and uh, another random variable is the sum of covariances. So we split this uh, covariance of a sum into the sums of covariances. So covariance of gamma 0 and u. u is a random variable. Gamma 0 is a constant. Covariance of a constant with the random variable is what? Who can help? What is the covariance between constant and the random variable? Zero? Exactly, it's zero. Uh, this part, uh, y is a variable, uh, u is also variable, so there is some covariance, so we don't know, but we will come to the answer, what is the covariance of this thing. We have a constant here, and this coefficient goes in front of covariance. What about this part? We can assume, it's not that important, but we can assume that covariance is also zero, because these two are mm, purely random variables, and they are not somehow related to each other. So we have only this middle term here with gamma put in front of covariance. Now what is the covariance of y and u? We can plug the expression for y into this expression, into covariance, and redo these same steps once again. Again covariance of beta 0 and u is zero. Uh, covariance of this part and u, well, we just repeat the same step here. Beta 1 goes in front of covariance. We have gamma 1, beta 1, x, and u. Uh, and covariance of u with itself. Any ideas? What is the covariance of a random variable with itself? One. What? One. No, no not one. No, no. So covariance of a random variable with itself is a variance. It's a variance of an error term okay. here. And look what we have. We have covariance of x and u equals something multiplied by covariance of x and u plus this stuff. So we can solve this equation for the covariance of x and u and get the following expression. Now the question is when this covariance is zero. It's very simple. Uh, this variance is not uh, able, uh, it's not possible this variance to be zero, it cannot be, uh, because it is a random variable, so the only possibility for this covariance to be zero is gamma 1 is zero. What does this mean that gamma 1 is zero? It means that x and y are not related through the second equation. If they are somehow related through the second equation, this covariance is not zero. If this covariance is not zero, uh, then uh, the first assumption of OLS doesn't hold. So uh, once the second equation is in place and once uh, gamma 1 is not zero, uh, this covariance is not zero, first assumption doesn't hold and we have biased estimate of uh, of a causal effect. Now to the topic we are going to introduce. 
what is instrumental variables and how it can help us to overcome a given problems. Immediate variable bias, error in variables bias and uh, this simultaneous causality bias. So these three problems can be eliminated with the method of instrumental variables. Uh, the idea of this method is very simple uh, and the practical application is not that difficult as well. Uh, assume that we have the following regression model with one regressor. And with the help of these instrumental variables regression, we want to break X into two parts. So one part which is correlated with U. So it is a problematic part. And another part is not correlated with U. This is the part that we want to extract from X. Because there are many different factors influencing X and some of these factors are hidden inside U. We want to kind of break X down into two parts. One part that we throw away, which is related to the unobservable factors or with the other factors that we have discussed. And the other factor is clean and the uh, exactly the, the part that we want to study. Uh, yes, and uh, if we isolate that part, which is not correlated with the error term, it is possible to estimate beta 1 consistently. And in order to do this, we introduce a special tool. This tool is called an instrumental variable. Usually it is denoted with Z. And this instrumental variable must be uncorrelated with the error term. So which means that it must be uncorrelated with all the factors, unobservable factors, not included into this regression. Didn't we use that as a, a fixed variable, no? We used, uh, that, we used we W used as a control one. variable, as I remember. Uh, not control. Uh, in the beginning of this course, uh, we uh, I thought we already denoted Z as something else. Well, sometimes we denote Z as the uh, normalized variable, the mean and uh, so the variable with the mean of zero and variance of Y. Maybe we denoted something else with that, but well, basically it doesn't matter. So in this we in this it. particular context, we will use Z as the notation for instrumental variable. Okay. Well, uh, again, the the tool that helps us to overcome these problems and to split X into two parts is called an instrumental variable, and uh, it must be uncorrelated with you. Uh, yeah, the role of this variable is to detect movements in X that aren't correlated with you. And with the help of this detection, uh, to estimate uh, consistently and unbiased, uh, without bias, uh, beta one. Uh, re related to instrumental variables, we have a special terminology. Uh, we have endogenous variable. This is the independent variable, one of the variables of X, which is correlated with the error term. So this is a problematic variable. Some, maybe it is uh, subject to omitted variable bias, may, maybe it is uh, measured with error, maybe it is subject to the simultaneous causality, but in either case, we call this variable endogenous. Exogenous variable is such variable that is not correlated with the error term. And uh, 
in order to have a valid instru instrumental variable or instrument uh, we must have two conditions so it must satisfy two conditions so one condition is the relevance it must be correlated with x so it must be somehow related to the problematic variable to the endogenous variable uh, of interest so remember that we want to know what is the causal effect of x on y but this additional instrumental variable must be related to x in some in some way and another condition for instrument is called instrument exogeneity so it must be exogenous to the regression model and it must have zero correlation with the error term these two conditions in practice are very problematic to satisfy and uh, in uh, the economic research i will show you in the next lecture several examples of such research uh, people become very famous if they find a proper instrumental variable that helps them to estimate causal effects without bias if you think about this these two conditions are not very simple to to establish because again once we have a problematic variable x is correlated with u and we must find such a variable that is not correlated with u but somehow related to x in some sense it must be random or as good as random well if the instrument is relevant what this first condition gives us then the variation in the instrument is related to the variation in x so we are able to kind of catch the part of x which is uh, changing uh, with the help of this instrument and what is most important that if this instrument is exogenous we are catching exactly the part of x that is not correlated with the error term And now let us discuss the application of these instrumental variables and how this looks like with uh, on, on a simple uh, in, in a simple case when we have a single regressor and we have a single instrument next lecture we will extend this model to the more general form of many regressors many instruments and uh, uh, which issues uh, appear in those cases so suppose for now that we have this instrument that satisfies both conditions relevance and exogeneity then we can estimate beta 1 with the help of two stage least squares estimator look this is a new class of estimators we knew ordinary least squares estimators uh, last time we spoke when we spoke about logit and probit we spoke about maximum likelihood estimators well we know them from statistics but uh, we somehow repeated there are method of moments estimators and now we introduce the fourth class of estimators which is called two stage least squares estimators this is completely new type of estimators or class of estimators so this estimator is calculated in two stage as the name suggests which is because if it's two stage least squares we have two stages so first stage we decompose x into two components a problematic component that may be correlated with the error term and a problem free component that is uncorrelated with the error and this is the desired part of this variable and the second stage uses the problem free component to estimate beta 1 
This is the logic. This is the idea what we want to do. So technically, how this is performed? In the first stage, we isolate the part of x that is uncorrelated with u. We do the following. We regress x on z. That is why we want the first condition of the instrument relevance to hold, because we want to regress x on z, and therefore, if they are correlated, we are able to estimate this, uh, this model. Uh, with the help of this model, we are able to decompose x into two parts. So that problem-free part is this. Since x is correlated with z, we can use the first part to predict movements in x that are related to the instrumental variable. And the second part, v, is the problematic part. So everything else that is correlated with the error term is accumulated in this v. Well, because z is exogenous, this part of x is uncorrelated with u. And v is that problematic or toxic part of x that somehow uh, that spoils our initial regression. Well, we don't know pi 0 and pi 1, but we are able to estimate them with the usual OLS. Because this is the usual regression, linear regression with run regressor, well, why not to estimate these two coefficients with OLS? After the OLS is performed, we have estimates of pi 0 and pi 1 with heads, and we are able to compute the predicted values of x, or fitted values of x, x hat, with the help of this part. So this is the logic of the first step. All of you are able to do this. If you have an instrument, if you have a problematic endogenous variable x, you are able to regress x on z to estimate pi 0 and pi 1, and then to produce the fitted values of x, x hat. And we believe, if z is a valid instrument, that these predicted values are not correlated with the error term in the main regression, when we regress y on x. So on the second stage, we replace x problematic x with its part x hat and then we regress y on x hat. So look, instead of using x, which is correlated with u, we derive a part of x which is not correlated with u and then we put it inside the main regression of interest. This is the second stage. And again, all the tools are familiar. We know how to estimate beta 0 and beta 1 in this regression. It is simply OLS. So this is why two-stage least squares. We apply least squares once in the uh, first stage part. And then we apply least squares twice uh, in the main regression. And since x hat is uncorrelated with the error term, the first OLS assumption holds. And we can hope to estimate beta 1 without bias and consistently. So uh, this argument is applied in the large samples. 
and everything that we are talking about right now is more or less applicable to the large samples. So next time we will discuss about the inference in two stageless squares and how the inference is performed. So hypothesis tests and uh, confidence intervals. Uh, but uh, the larger the sample you have, the better is going to be your estimation. And the resulting estimators of beta 0 and beta 1 are called two stage least squares estimators. And uh, in order to somehow show that they are different from OLS estimators, we put this uh, index that it's not just beta 0 and beta 1 head, but this is beta 0 and beta 1 TSLS. Is the logic of two stageless squares clear? Which steps do we need to perform in order to derive these estimators? Yes. Separate them. So the practical the practical application of two SLS uh, is uh, problematic because of the need to find this proper instrument. Again, we will move this discussion to the next lecture. I will show you several nice examples of instruments that are used in economic research and uh, that gave their authors uh, fame in economics. Uh, but for now, you just need to understand the idea. And well, sometimes, sometimes, if you do uh, the, let's say, some, some routine estimations, uh, these two stageless squares can be applied uh, without need to find uh, some, let's say, specific instruments. So I will show you also this example today. So now, how this estimator looks like. We know how the OLS estimator looks like. It is a covariance estimate of x and y divided by the variance of x, if you remember uh, the first part of econometrics. Uh, now, how the two stageless squares uh, can be estimated uh, formally? Uh, we can derive this with the help of a covariance between y and z. So you will see how we will arrive to the estimate, estimator of uh, beta 1. So covariance of y and z. Instead of y, we plug the expression for y here, and then we already did um, the derivations of covariance, of covariance of beta 0 and z is zero because beta zero is a constant uh, covariance of u and z by the second condition of exogeneity is also zero so this is why it is so important to have z not correlated with u so covariance of x and z is non-zero this is the condition of relevance uh, so zero here zero here in the middle, we have beta 1 times covariance of x and z. Well, what do we have? Look, we have covariance of y and z equals beta 1 times covariance of x and z. From here, it is very simple to express beta 1. So beta 1, the true population parameter, equals to the covariance of y and z divided by the covariance of x and z. Now, if we want to estimate beta 1, what do we need to do? We need to replace covariances, the, the population covariances, which are unknown. We don't know what are these covariances. We just believe that both of them are non-zero. But we can replace these population covariances with the sample covariances. Remember the statistics. In statistics, if you want to estimate something, we just change it with the sample analog, like here. And beta 1 uh, for two stageless squares estimator 
can be perform can be estimated simply as the sample covariance of y and z with the sample covariance of x and z. If you don't want to perform this into two stages, if you want to estimate beta one uh, in one step, that's here. Uh, how to prove that beta one had estimated with two stage least squares is consistent. Uh, I know that probably you uh, forgot about consistency and the rules of consistency that we have discussed uh, during mathematical statistics. So that was about the convergence and probability. Uh, well, just a short reminder. What does this mean that estimator is consistent? It means that the probability that it falls within an interval of the true population value tends to one as the sample size increases. So basically the large deviations of estimate from the population parameter are not possible when the sample size increases. And uh, well, what do we want? Uh, in order to prove that this estimator is consistent, we want to remember, we use this in mathematical statistics course, that uh, sample estimate of covariance uh, converges in probability to the population estimate, uh, to the population covariance. So when the sample size increases, sample covariance converges to the population covariance. Again, with the sample size increases, uh, the population covariance of uh, sorry, the sample covariance of x and z converges in probability to the population covariance. So when both numerator and denominator converge to their population counterparties, we can say that this fraction converges to this fraction, and we know that this fraction is just beta one. So. Finally, in large samples, the estimator of beta one derived with the procedure of two stageless squares converges to beta one, and this is consistent. So we are done if we are able to use an instrumental variable that is relevant and exogenous we are able to estimate consistently beta one and we are free of those three problems that we have discussed in the beginning of this lecture omitted variable bias simultaneous causality and error in variables as i said in many practical issues it is not possible to overcome those problems in some other way. So uh, let's see one example. This is a routine example, by the way. It is not uh, something that uh, can be, let's say, invented specially. It is the first case when instrumental variables has been used uh, in econometric practice, let's say. So it was originally developed to estimate demand elasticity for agricultural goods, well, for example, butter. So here is the population model where logarithm of quantity demanded is represented as the function of a logarithm of price. Why logs? Because when we have log log specification of a model, beta one has a meaning or interpretation of, a, of an elasticity. So beta one shows how much quantity demanded changes in percent when price changes by 1%. This is exactly elasticity. If quantity changes less than 1%, demand is not elastic. 
if quantity changes more than 1%, demand is price elastic. You might remember this from economics classes. What is the problem with this estimation of a demand elasticity? It is, if you think about this, this is practically a very problematic uh, task. Well, we can collect the data observations on price and quantity of butter for different years years month doesn't matter so some time periods but OLS regression is gonna suffer from simultaneous causality bias are there any ideas why do we have simultaneous causality bias in this case Because if price affects quantity demanded, then uh, quantity demanded changes, like decreases, and the price will also be affected. Um, not exactly. Think about the reasons why observed. Because look, we are, when we are talking about demand equation, we are talking about potential quantity that people are ready to buy given price we are talking about potential things uh, when we collect the observed data this observed data is not the same as the willingness of customers what else affects these observations of price and quantity It's not exactly the same as I showed you previously when you are able to write down one equation of quantity and price and then price on quantity and then you are fine with the simultaneous causality bias. It's, it's not... Okay, you can think about this, but what exactly represents the second equation in this case? So the first equation is demand. The second equation when you regress price on quantity, represents what? Or might represent? What else affects prices and quantities on the market? Supply? You know, you know, supply, yes. You have two equations where price and quantity are related to each other. One equation is demand and second equation is supply. So those two equations when Q and P are determined simultaneously, are exactly demand and supply. And in this case, this is why OLS regression will suffer from simultaneous causality bias. Not because price affects quantity and quantity affects price. No, it's just, you know, some speculations. Uh, it's about two market forces where both price and quantity are um, represented. So look, uh, we can illustrate this case with the following uh, picture. Look, for example, we have one year. Demand is here, supply is here. And the observation, one particular point, is here. So this is the equilibrium price and quantity in period one. Then second year, something affected demand, for example, income of people increased and people uh, and the demand shifted to the right, but also something affected supply. Uh, if supply uh, moves to the left, maybe wages increased, maybe cost of production increased, maybe something else. Uh, but uh, we have an intersection of demand and supply here this is the point in the third year demand moves farther to the right and supply also increases and shifts here to the right and uh, down so maybe uh, there are some favorable conditions for producers and that's why supply shifted to the right and you see that the observational data on price and quantity 
appears as the result of two forces of demand and supply. As a result, we will have something like this. When we collect the observations, after several years of demand and supply interaction, we will get this. Do we see something similar to the demand line? No. Moreover, we, we don't see any correlation between price and quantity here. And this is the problem. Because if we just take these observations and feed into the OLS estimation procedure, we get something, we would get something strange. We would get probably beta 1 equals 0 in this case. And we will see next lecture, we will take a particular example of demand elasticity estimation and you will see how this works. So now, how instrumental variables can help us to solve this problem? Look, when we want to estimate the demand equation, so the demand curve, basically what is interesting for us, we want to know the slope. We are not very interested in the, uh, in the intercept of this demand curve, but probably it's also good to know. But uh, in particular, we want to know the intercept. So we want to do something to fix the demand curve in one place and move only the supply curve along this demand line, like this. Look, what do we want to know? We want to throw away all the uh, changes in quantity that are affected by demand forces. And we want to keep only the factors that affected supply. Those exogenous to demand those factors that affected quantity but don't affect demand and in this case like visually we will get something like you see on the on the slide so we want to isolate shifts in price and quantity due to the shifts in supply only they must be exogenous to demand and now the question is, what can shift supply and what does not affect demand? So in this study, so the instrumental variable Z is going to be a variable that shifts supply but does not affect demand. In this case, the authors first they proposed a rainfall in dairy producing regions. So if we are talking about price and quantity of butter and demand elasticity of butter, then the producers of butter are some farmers, some farmer regions. And of course, the level of rainfall can affect the production of butter. If there is let's let's think why this instrument is valid well first of all it is exogenous because rainfall does not affect demand for butter think about this if it's rainy outside do you want to drink more or less uh, milk or do you want to drink, uh, to consume more or less butter i don't think so well at least there is no reasonable uh, way how you can how you can argue that people change their demand for butter due to the weather. Well, rainfall should not affect demand in principle. Uh, is this relevant to the price? Yes, because if it's 
less rain in the region, there is less grazing, so cows are consuming less, less of uh, grass, and then there is a less production of butter. And if there is a less production, the supply curve would shift to the left and the price will be increasing. So we are able to isolate changes in price only due to the supply with the help of this instrument. And basically, this is the way how people now in industry try to estimate the demand curves. You cannot simply collect prices and quantities and hope that your beta 1 estimate is going to be unbiased. You will probably get something very poor. You need to do this two-step procedure. First of all, together with prices and quantities, you need to find some factor that affected supply and did not affect the demand. Well, in practice, there are such factors, so rainfall, for example. And you can, you can see that rainfall is, in some sense, it is random to the to the whole situation, right? So the market cannot influence the rainfall. The rainfall comes from outside. Uh, in other markets, you can think about this as, uh, as uh, about these instruments as well, maybe some un un unexpected closures of factories, maybe some, uh, some incidents in factories. Uh, earthquakes, uh, again, some weather uh, force majeures. Uh, by the way, those people who study Russian economy, they use sanctions as an instrument affecting supply because, well, sanctions somehow affect the industries and they do not affect the demand of people. This is another more or less good instrument uh, for researchers who want to establish the demand elasticity or even some other uh, causal effects. Well, and finally, how should we perform this regression? First of all, we regress the logarithm of price on the rainfall and we get the fitted value of this log price. And this fitted value isolates changes in log price only because of the supply factors. And then in the second stage, we regress log of quantity on this fitted value of log price. And we are able to estimate the demand elasticity uh, for butter in this case. Well, next lecture, we will do the practical task with the estimation of uh, demand elasticity for cigarettes. The second example is hypothetical example. Uh, nobody uh, performed such kind of research uh, and it is proposed by Stock and Watson also. Uh, consider the regression about the test scores. Uh, there is still possibility for omitted variable bias, maybe like parental involvement into the uh, education of their kids. And we also can eliminate bias with the help of instrumental variables regression. Uh, what might be a hypothetical instrument? If, if some schools were forced to close because of a summer earthquake, Let's say there is something happened, some incident happened, and some schools are just closed. What happens? The kids from these schools must be relocated to the closest schools, right? So the districts closest to the epicenter, they need to double number of students. And the class size temporarily increases. And look, this factor affects class size, but this factor is not related to the test score. 
So again, both conditions, relevance and uh, exogeneity, they might be fulfilled. So we can use uh, this as a binary variable. One, if the, uh, if the district has been hit by earthquake and zero otherwise. And then the earthquake makes it as districts were in a random uh, assigned experiment. So the variation of student-teacher ratio is going to be exogenous to the test scores. And uh, in the first stage, we regress student-teacher ratio on the earthquake and extract this part, which somehow uh, exogenously uh, change and exogenously to the student teacher uh, to the to the test score sorry so this is hypothetical example don't take it seriously i mean if for example we wanted to do something you know, with that regression uh, this is one hypothetical instrument that we could have used well overall so today my goal was to introduce you to the idea of instrumental variables without any technicalities without any estimation just you needed to understand why this method works and uh, how we can use this method in order to overcome some problems in ols estimation uh, well, the whole idea is based on the two-stage approach. Uh, first, we regress endogenous variable, problematic variable on the instrument. This instrument must be exogenous and relevant. With the help of the first stage, we obtain fitted values. On the second step, we regress the variable, dependent, vari dependent variable y on these fitted values of x hat and uh, very important question very troublesome question is how to find these valid instruments as i said in the economic research you will be very very lucky and very famous if you are able to find a proper instrument that convinces people that uh, you are able with the help of this instrument to estimate the causal effects. On the next lecture, we'll discuss technical details of two-stage least squares estimation, and uh, we will see the empirical example. As I said, demand elasticity estimation for cigarettes. Since we didn't do anything with the estimation for this week you are free no home assignment uh, accumulate your energy and force to the next weeks question guys and don't forget you you have uh, the third home assignment till tomorrow In this case, thanks for your attention and participation today. Have a nice week and see you next Monday. See you. Thank you for the class. Thanks for nice the lesson. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good.